สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program where we study the words of the Buddha on the path to enlightenment, helping you to understand the wisdom that it takes to move the mind to this enlightened mental state, where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing any discontent feelings. The anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear. Boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy—all of these discontent feelings and others are eliminated from the enlightened mind. And there's many, many different teachings that one would need to learn in order to gradually move the mind to this enlightened mental state. It's the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, the natural law of gamma, what is merit, the. From a Vaharas, you know more and more and more the things that are in the beginning part of this uh, program and the beginning part of this book. But there is a point where it really makes sense to start discussing the cycle of rebirth, and that's what today's class is really all about: is to start giving you kind of a introduction to the cycle of rebirth in these various realms of existence. Up until now, for students who start learning with me. When they first start learning, usually the first three, six months, maybe even the first year or so, I might suggest to them to just kind of postpone any investigation of the cycle of rebirth until they've already absorbed the teachings that it really takes to move the mind closer and closer to enlightenment in developing your practice through those three universal truths, four noble truths, eightfold path, and others. But there does become a time where it just makes sense to start getting introduced to the cycle of rebirth. But even with that said, just keep in mind that everything that I'm going to share with you about today's class, what's happened in the past is in the past, and there's been these countless births that we're going to be talking about today. And then what may or may not happen in the future, it's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. Right now, you're a human being, and while being a human being, it's the most ideal existence, and this is where you can actually really make significant steps to getting to enlightenment. That's what's really important. So as I introduce you to the cycle of rebirth today, through helping you understand this evolution of our consciousness, moving the mind from these animal existences to the human existence, this is helpful. It will truly help you in your practice. But I encourage you not to get too wrapped around what it is that we're going to be discussing today, because as I mentioned, what's in happened in the past is in the past. What may or may not happen in the future is in the future. The goal is for you to get to enlightenment. And that is where is going to ultimately solve the problems that you're experiencing in this existence, in the cycle of rebirth, where it really helps to understand the evolution of our consciousness from animal to human, is that as you hear me share the teachings with you today, is that an unenlightened mind functions very much like an animal. Because of the craving, anger, and ignorance in the mind, it functions very much like an animal because our mind has been conditioned by so many countless animal existences. We are human. We are no longer animal. Even though some people might describe humans as an animal, we are not an animal. We are a human being. We are in a human existence. But because the mind has experienced so many countless animal births, the unenlightened mind in the human Existence functions very much like an animal, and what you're doing on this path to enlightenment is you're walking closer and closer to the light, evolving the consciousness, becoming a better and better human being, functioning more and more like a human being. So, where today's class is really going to help you the most, I think, is that when you understand the evolution of our consciousness from animal to human, when you Can spot those animalistic behaviors that we do as human beings, then you can understand that this is what you're working to purge out of your life practice. And by understanding the animalistic instincts and the animalistic behaviors and the way that we function in the human world as if we are still animals, then you'll be able to then. Observe those, spot those, and then decide that you would like to purge those from your life, and then evolve to becoming this better and better human being. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the class, and uh, thank you for joining to learn and understand 
the teachings of the Buddha around the cycle of rebirth. We're going to be discussing many different aspects of this uh, and just really introducing it to you, but it's a really good introduction to get you started. We're going to be talking about the problems and how these animal consciousness has conditioned the mind. We're going to be talking about the five realms of existence. We're going to be talking about this path to enlightenment and how it's helping us to evolve our mind. And remember, just like everything that I teach, I encourage you not to believe anything that I share. Instead, learn, reflect, and practice so that you can see the truth for yourself. There's never a time where you should just necessarily believe the cycle of rebirth because belief isn't going to get you to the truth to being able to understand it. But the more that you understand about the cycle of rebirth and you observe the world around you, you can see the truth in it. And should you ever observe past lives, you'll surely know the truth for yourself that the cycle of rebirth is 100% the truth. As we go through today's class, there'll be times where you can ask questions and I'll just pause and open up to any questions. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. I would like to ask if you could just ask questions based on the content that I've already shared in the class. That would be wonderful and kind of keep our class moving in a certain direction. And then as we have time towards the end, we can open up to any and all questions that you like. But just because this is such a big topic, it's important that we kind of ask questions based on what I've taught up to that point and then ask questions on that. And then we can open up to any and all questions uh, towards the end. So I'll just switch over to some uh, visual aids that I use here to help us in the class because as I mentioned the first thing that I would like to share with you guys is helping you to understand the problems in the unenlightened mind and how this has evolved out of our animal consciousness. So if you were in this program when I talked about the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires this is Craving, Anger, and Ignorance. This is chapter eight in this first volume, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. And if you joined this program recently, you may not have yet heard me discuss Craving, Anger, and Ignorance, but I'm gonna share a little bit of that with you now so that you guys can at least understand it or kind of refresh your memory so that you can see how animals function very much through Craving, Anger, and Ignorance. And in the human existence with the polluted mind being unenlightened, we also function through craving, anger, and ignorance. What this craving or this greed or this desire, this attachment is, this is the mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. This is where the mind is chasing after the objects of its affection. It just thinks if it gets the objects of its affection, that everything will be satisfied. Everything will be just fine. So as human beings, we chase and chase and chase and chase, and we want the objects of our affection because of this mental longing and strong eagerness. If we get the objects of our affection, we get these pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. But if we don't get what we want, that's where the painful feelings come in and we experience this anger or this sadness or this frustration or this irritation, this annoyance or this dislike. And then there's these neither painful nor pleasant feelings like displeasure or unsatisfactoriness that are, are in the unenlightened mind as well. Well, this craving, this mental longing and strong eagerness, wanting certain things, this is like an animal chasing a prey, right? Like if a dog chased a rabbit or a, a fox chased a rabbit or if a lion was chasing a gazelle right or if a snake is you know chasing a spider or something like this this is like a prey animal chasing after the objects of its affection and that's what's happening in the unenlightened state is the mind is still chasing just like in the animal existences and then like i mentioned if we get what we want and we fulfill that then there's these pleasant feelings. But if we don't get what we want, then there's this anger, there's this aggression, there's this bitterness, this hostility that comes into the mind. And in the human state, we tend to have unskillful conduct through our intentions, our speech, and our actions. We speak in ways or we act in ways that is very unskillful based on our anger that has arisen. This is much like an animal, right? An animal, if you 
get what you want and other animals are doing what you want, okay, everything's pretty peaceful. But as soon as an, one animal starts to do something that you don't like, rawr, right? We kind of roar and we growl or we hiss or whatever it is that that animal does in order to put fear into this other animal to submit and do what it is that that animal wants it to do. Well, the human mind is doing essentially the same thing with our aggressiveness, our bitterness, our hostility. We're growling and we're roaring at other human beings, hoping that they will submit to our will because we're misunderstanding. We think that this other being is causing our anger or causing our discontent mind. And we think if we growl and roar and fear them into doing what it is that we want them to do, then we will get the objects of our affection and now we'll be happy. But this problem just keeps going on and on and on like a cycle. And where all this is coming from is the ignorance or the delusion or the misunderstanding or the confusion that's in the mind. This is what the unenlightened mind is experiencing is this lack of wisdom. And because of this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, then the craving continues to persist and when there's craving, there's going to be anger, this ill will, this bitterness and hostility. So what a practitioner is doing is working to understand these three poisons or these three unwholesome roots or these three fires so that then you can transform them. That's what the path to enlightenment is all about. But the reason why these things exist in the mind is that the mind just hasn't cultivated enough wisdom to eliminate them. And that's what the path to enlightenment is all about. This is how animals function through craving, through anger, through ignorance, right? As animals, we have, we want food, uh, we want, um, you know, certain uh, pleasurable things, uh, we want to mate, we want to sit around and sleep, you know, we want water, we want a certain territory, you know, we as animals go around and we mark our territory with urine and feces or the scent of our body and we mark this territory and we say this is our territory you know any other animals that come into this territory then we attack them right and, and we try to fear them into not coming any longer and as human beings we essentially do the same thing we mark out our territory right we have a certain fence around our house and if somebody comes close you know we're kind of a little bit uh fearful or angry or, or suspicious of that same thing like as an animal if uh, we have little cubs or if we have little babies, you know, we really protect them and fiercely protect them as animals. Same thing as human beings. We have these little babies. And then if somebody does something that we find disapprove, disapproval in, then, you know, we roar and we growl and we get angry in the unenlightened state. But we can evolve past all of this, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this craving anger and ignorance is the core problem at a high level that's happening in the unenlightened mind of a human being. And as you guys will hear me talk about, this is coming from our countless rebirths. But what's allowing all this to persist is this ignorance or this lack of wisdom. There's also this personal existence view or this conceit that is existing in the unenlightened mind and it's existing in the animal existences as well. We talked in chapter 16 about these. Personal existence view is the misperception or the false belief or the misunderstanding that this physical body is who you are as a person or that this mind is who you are as a person. So there's this, you know, self image that the unrelated mind is maybe wanting to project in the world. And when we hear agreeable things about that, we get these pleasant feelings in the unenlightened state. Or when we hear these disagreeable things, then we get these painful feelings in the unenlightened state because we have this certain self-image and we associate this body with who we are as a person. And then the same thing with the self-identity in the mind. You know, I am a Buddhist teacher. If the mind thought this way that I am a Buddhist teacher, then whenever you hear agreeable things like, oh, Buddhist teachers are so lovely, they're so kind, they're so friendly. Oh, there's these pleasant feelings that come in. But then when somebody starts saying something disparaging or degrading about Buddhist teachers, if the mind identifies with that's who I am as a person, then when we hear these disagreeable things, then there's going to be painful feelings as a result of that. So this personal existence view is existing in the animal existence because it's needed. 
right? If a deer walked out into the middle of a field and like, yeah, this body isn't mine, you know, it doesn't belong to me, it's all impermanent, you know, if something happens, you know, I'll protect myself, but, you know, I'm not going to walk around with a bunch of fear. Well, what happens when the bear or the lion or something else comes? If that fear for the deer isn't there, then it doesn't have that reaction to, to leave, right? So it's not going to be able to sustain its life. So this personal existence view in the animal existences is needed in order for self-preservation, in order to exist in that realm. There needs to be a personal existence view. And then in the human world as well as in the animal world in the unenlightened state there's this conceit or this arrogance or this pride right this measuring and comparing this judging others this is detrimental to the mind because the mind wants to put itself above others and look down on people or it wants to put itself below others and look up to people and then when we're feeling like we're above others and talking down with arrogance and pride, we damage our relationships and we're not able to conduct ourselves in uh, you know, wholesome ways that allow our personal and professional relationships to blossom. But then when we put ourselves below others, this is detrimental to the mind too and very dangerous for the mind because then the mind is uncalm. It's not... It's not stable, it's not steady, it's shaken up when it's around somebody that you look up to. Instead of viewing all beings as equal, when there's this conceit in the mind, it's gonna to wanna to put itself above people and it's gonna to wanna to put itself below people. This is also coming from the animal existences. Because when we were a pack of wolves, we needed our alpha male and our alpha female to mate in order to develop our, our pack. And they also needed to teach us how to hunt. They needed to teach us how to be wolves so that we could go out and survive in this harsh world as wolves. We needed the matriarch of our elephant herd in order to show us where the water holes were and to show us where to eat food and how to migrate from one part of the land to another part. So each animal uh, existence in each individual way that we were maybe in a pack of animals or a herd or something like this, it was important to have that pecking order that we knew who the matriarch was or we knew who the alpha male and alpha female were in our pack of wolves. And this was detrimental to our survival in the animal existences. So as we evolve from these animal existences into the human world, we maintain these qualities because our mind has been conditioned based on all those different countless rebirths in the animal realm. So <clears throat> when we come into the human realm, we still have this conceit where we either want to be above people, we want to be the alpha, <clears throat> or we put ourselves below people, which is, once again, very detrimental in the human existence. In the animal existence, it's absolutely needed. We wouldn't be able to survive without that alpha male and alpha female or without that matriarch of our elephant herd. But in the human realm, these things just create separation and division, and it causes us concern and, and problems, and we struggle when we're putting ourselves above and below others. So this personal existence view and conceit that we're working to eliminate in the human realm as part of the path to as part of the path to enlightenment is absolutely what's needed to get to enlightenment and experience this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. But in the the reason why it's so difficult and it's so challenging is because of all the different existences that we've had as animals, that we want that pecking order. We either want to be the alpha or we want to put ourselves below others, but this is not going to promote healthy personal and professional relationships with people around you as long as your mind is wanting to do that where you're measuring and comparing and judging others and trying to determine if you're above people or below people, because now you talk to one group of people that you feel that are below you in one way, and then the people that you feel are above you, you talk in a different way. Your mind will constantly try to figure out if you're above people or below people, and this is gonna burden the mind with all kinds of struggles and difficulties. So while it's a challenge to eliminate personal existence view and conceit, 
as you do so and once you do so, the mind will actually be a lot more peaceful. It's just a real struggle to let that go because of these countless animal existences that have been conditioning the mind to think this way and operate this way. These, this current life and all of our previous lives have conditioned the mind to function in a certain way. Because essentially, as we are born into a wolf pack, we learn how to be a wolf from other wolves that are older than us. We have these kind of learned and uh, you know instinctive behaviors, and then we kind of conform to what other people or what other beings are doing, what other wolves or what other elephants are doing. We learn how to be an elephant from other elephants, or we learn how to be a snake from other snakes. But here in the human realm, we do the exact same thing, which is fine, but if you're surrounded by a whole lot of craving, anger, and ignorance, and you're taking your cues from the people that are around you, then your mind in your current life has been conditioned to function through craving, anger, and ignorance. And this is also from our past lives as well. The whole reason why we still exist in this life now is because we haven't yet cultivated the wisdom to eradicate craving, anger, and ignorance. So therefore, we continue to exist in the cycle of rebirth. As long as we continue to exist in the cycle of rebirth, there's going to be this continuous rebirth. There's going to be continuous difficulties where there's sickness, aging, and death. If there's craving in the mind at the time of death, that mental longing and strong eagerness, if that any kind of craving whatsoever exists at the time of death, then there's going to be rebirth in one of the five realms, which we're about to talk about. And if there's birth, there's going to be sickness, aging, and death. You can't avoid sickness, aging, and death as long as there's birth. The only way to avoid sickness, aging, and death is to not be born. And it's training the mind to eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance that the mind gets to enlightenment in this life. You experience this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy for the rest of your life. Then there's no more rebirth at the end of that. You've eliminated the conditions that cause rebirth in a future life. So craving is what decides whether there is rebirth. And then it's your gamma or the results of your decisions that determines in what condition you're going to experience in that next life. So we've been in, in this constant cycle of experiencing craving, anger, and ignorance over and over and over again. And it's not until we extinguish these that then there's no longer any rebirth. One of the ways to think about this is that if you had a fire and a fire was burning and there was all this fuel on the fire and it's kicking off all these sparks, that spark is going to be carried by the wind and it's going to land in some leaves or some brush and then it's going to ignite a new fire. So as long as there's fuel on this fire, it's going to keep kicking off sparks and then there's this new fire that gets created as a result of this spark. So the craving in the mind, this mental longing and strong eagerness is one of those fires that is burning and raging. And as long as that exists in the mind at the time of death, there's going to be another life. But if you can extinguish the craving, then there's no sparks. There's nothing that allows this continuous existence to occur. So while the problem that each being is experiencing is craving anger and ignorance, and these are the fires that are burning that need to be extinguished. That's the problem that is being experienced. And that's what's keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state. But the bigger problem that all beings are facing is the cycle of rebirth, being constantly reborn over and over and over again. But the unique way that this is, is that if you eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance, and you solve the problem of the discontent mind, then not only have you attained enlightenment and eliminated discontentedness, but you've also solved this bigger problem of the cycle of rebirth and countless rebirths in the cycle of rebirth. So it's kind of like a two for one. So if you like shopping and you get a, you know, buy one, get one free or, or buy one, get two or something like that, this is kind of one of those situations where you solve one problem, you've actually solved the others too. So by solving the discontent mind, by eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance, then you experience this peacefulness, and then you know you've also solved the cycle of rebirth too. You'll no longer be reborn ever again. 
And this is one of the beauties about the Buddhist teachings is that instead of just believing a bunch of things and then hoping you figured it out and then at death something good happens to you, instead you learn now, you reflect now, you practice now, and you experience the results now. So you know that you're progressing on this path to enlightenment as the discontentedness is gradually diminishing in the mind and you see more calmness, you see more composure, you see more steadiness coming into the mind, then you know what you're learning and you're practicing, whatever wisdom that you're cultivating, this is leading to an improved condition of mind now. So this is how you can see the evolution of your consciousness moving from these animal existences to the human existence where you're becoming more and more human. And this is why when you get to that first stage of enlightenment, as I taught way back at the beginning of the program, those four stages, the stream enter, the once returner, the non-returner, and the otter hunt, which the otter hunt is actually enlightened. When you get to that first stage of enlightenment as a stream enter, from that point, you will never be reborn into the lower realms ever again as animal, I'm sorry, as hell being animal being or a afflicted spirit. Because at that point, if you die as a stream enter in the first stage of enlightenment, you will come back into the human realm because you've evolved your consciousness to the point that you're now functioning more and more like a human being. So you've shed enough of this animal consciousness that if you die in the first or second stage of enlightenment, then you are reborn back into the human realm. If you die in the third stage of enlightenment, then you will be reborn back into the heavenly realm. And from there, you will attain enlightenment in the heavenly realm. But that's not necessarily desirable or what you're interested in. The fourth stage of enlightenment, which is the mind is actually enlightened, this person is an otter hunt. That's what you're actually looking to achieve is to no longer experience any rebirth anywhere, not in the animal realm, not in the human realm, not in the heavenly realm. This is what you would ultimately like to experience. And this is how through the Buddhist teachings, you can observe that the mind is doing that and walking towards that because you see this gradual declining of discontentedness as you're getting closer and closer to enlightenment. I'm gonna be sharing with you in a moment the five realms of existence and the various qualities and the various things that are experienced in those five realms. But before I do that, I'm going to open up to questions. And as I open up to questions, I would like to just kind of share something with you. As I introduce these topics to you today about the cycle of rebirth and the five realms, it's important to understand that the Buddha nor I share anything about the cycle of rebirth in order to fear, guilt, or shame somebody into learning and practicing the teachings. If you've learned in other traditions where maybe fear or guilt or shame was used in order to motivate you to learn certain teachings, that's not what the Buddha did. When you look at his teachings and you look at the way that I present these teachings, there's no fear, guilt, or shame that is being used in order to motivate somebody to learn and practice the teachings of the Buddha. So if you have that experience in the past, when we start talking about hell or the animal realm or afflicted spirits or the human realm or the heavenly realm, that conditioning of mind might come to the mind, but you're going to need to set that aside because there's never a time where the Buddha used guilt, shame, or fear in order to motivate people to learn his teachings. Because remember, those are feelings that the Buddha is helping people to eliminate as part of the path to enlightenment, is helping them to purify the mind and eliminate the all discontent feelings, including guilt, shame, and fear. So a person that is a Buddha wouldn't use guilt, shame, and fear to motivate somebody to eliminate guilt, shame, and fear. So as I share about these different teachings, the Buddha and what I'm sharing is just to explain to you what the truth is so that you understand what exists in the world. And if you're experiencing any guilt or shame or fear that's arising, just know that that's based on your own craving, desire, attachment. This can be uh, arising based on conditioning from previous experiences that you've had. And you just need to take an active role in setting that aside so that then you can approach these teachings and learn them 
based on what it is that is being shared in the class and you can ask whatever questions that you would like to ask. So I'll just turn things over to you guys for a bit here to ask any questions that you like. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom electronically and ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir, Rick has his hand up. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, in regards to the second item, uh, personal existence view and conceit, the self and the ego, Mina asks, um, here we go, when we feel protective towards family members, what is the best way to distance from that defense mechanism of personal existence view? For example, if another uh, child is distracting our child in class, is it best to tell our child to let it go or have them speak up and kindly request to be allowed to focus on the teacher? Is that defensive and using animal instinct or no? we can make wise decisions in order to help a situation like this. And it's kind of like two prong, right? Like we can't control all the kids in the class to ensure that they're not distracting our child, but we can teach our child how to cultivate concentration and focus. And also, you know, if the child needs to let the teacher know that something problematic is happening in the class, we can teach them that too. But just teaching them to tell the teacher, for example, doesn't solve the problem 100%. So there's usually kind of multiple uh, directions that you need to advise a child on something like this, where you can help them to learn meditation and learn how to not be distracted by certain things. You can even have training where if it's a real problem in their class, you can have situations where you in your home, train them to not be distracted by certain things and kind of uh, kind of role play these situations and help them to build more focus and concentration while you're kind of trying to do distracting things around them. It can be like a game, right? So that's one aspect is helping the child to cultivate more focus and concentration, but then giving them the tools that they need to be able to let the teacher know that this problematic thing is happening in the class and then rather than us as parents jumping right in to have a conversation with the with the teacher and all of those kind of things, equipping our child to be able to have that conversation with the teacher so that they can then become more and more of an independent decision maker and be able to handle these challenges themselves, that's what you're going towards, right? If as parents, we tend to oftentimes when we have our own attachments to our child, we wanna jump right in there and solve the problem for them because we're not interested in them going through any trouble. But the thing is, is the way that you learn how to be a problem solver is that you did experience difficulties and you had to figure them out. So oftentimes we think we're doing the best thing by jumping in there and trying to solve a problem, when in reality, sometimes it's better to kind of pull back, equip our child with more wisdom so that then they can enter into that situation and then have the focus and concentration they need or be able to make wise decisions to get a teacher involved if that's what needs to happen. And we'll find a lot more success that way because we can't jump in and solve every single challenge that our child's are experiencing or our children are experiencing. We can't jump in and solve every single one, but because we spend so much time with our children, we can equip them with wisdom that helps them understand how to make wise decisions in that situation. And one of the wise decisions is to focus, have concentration, potentially get an adult involved if that's what needs to happen. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Brandon, do I have a question? Um, yes, sir. Uh, I have a few questions, actually. Um, regarding previous lives, can there be specific effects on how the mind works in this existence because of certain animal existences, like specific fears, specific cravings, those types of things? Yeah, so as you heard me mention that if we have craving in the mind at the time of death, there's going to be rebirth. And uh, our gamma, or the results of our decisions in that life is going to determine what our rebirth is going to be, which realm we're in, and what condition we're going to be in that realm. <clears throat> well, as rebirth occurs, I describe it as like cardboard boxes. There's cardboard box A, there's cardboard box B. And 
these two cardboard boxes look completely different, different shape, different size, different thickness, different color of box. But what transfers from one life to the next is the cravings from one life move into the mind of the next life and residual memories move over into this new life as well. This is why a being in a new life can have cravings from their previous lives but they're acting on those cravings now, creating gamma in this life. And that's why they can also observe past lives is because there's these residual memories that are moving from one mind to the other. And then those memories can come up to the surface and we can then potentially see our past lives. So when the Buddha talks about how when we make a certain decision, we're going to experience the results of that decision or we're going to experience the gamma in this life, in the next life, or some subsequent occasion, which means some future life. It's not like this gamma, it's not like there's this black cloud that is kind of hovering over us and kind of following us around. It's not like there's this supreme being that's kind of deciding what punishment and rewards that we get or anything like that. That's not what the natural law of gamma is or these cravings that we have. Instead, this topic is actually connected because what's causing all the unwholesome results in any existence is craving, anger, and ignorance. Anytime we function through craving, anger, and ignorance, we're going to make an unwise decision that is going to produce unwholesome results. And conversely, when we function through generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, it's going to produce wholesome results in our life. So when cardboard box A disintegrates and that craving and residual memory moves into cardboard box B, the way that cardboard box B or the second life now experiences gamma from the previous life is because of the cravings that are in the mind and this lack of wisdom. Now this being is starting to function in this new life with those same old cravings or that same old ignorance. And now when we function in this new life with those old cravings and ignorance, now we're going to be creating gamma in this life based on things from previous life. So this is how we get to experience our gamma from previous lives, where conversely, if we extinguish certain cravings and we arise certain wisdom in this particular life, when there's rebirth, there's less cravings and less ignorance that the mind has to deal with in that next rebirth. So that's how we experience things from one life to the next because the craving is moving over to this new life and also residual memories. So you can experience cravings from previous lives that affect you in this life. So it's not the actual black cloud of gamma you know, following us. It's our cravings that are moving over. And now we're creating new decisions in this life based on old cravings. Thank you, sir. To follow up with that just briefly, can wisdom gained during this existence then be transferred to the next existence also, or at least maybe be easier in the next existence to kind of gain or regain that wisdom, sir? Yes, that's part of that residual memories. So if somebody is working, like say, for example, on this path and they're learning the teachings and then they die in, say, the first stage of enlightenment or maybe even less, as they move into their next existence, that wisdom is going to be there in the mind. You know, when they're born, they're not going to have the wisdom right away from when they're born. But as they age, these residual memories can arise in the mind and the work that you've done in one life will benefit you in a future life. So wisdom is part of those residual memories. This is why you can see like a three or four year old child prodigy who's never touched a piano, but they can walk over to a piano and they can play the most beautiful music you've ever heard. You know, we call them a genius or this master. But in reality, what's actually happened is they have these residual memories from having done that in a previous life. So now when they're reborn, they are now four years old and they can play like master piano because they have these residual memories of this wisdom that they cultivated in a previous life. So you can see this in our world around us, that there's this craving and residual memories that move forward. And they can be painful memories, uh, you know, things that we have fears about. Um, and they can also be certain wisdom, like what we're talking about here. 
Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, and then to move on about um, self-preservation, for those on this path that are learning deeply on this path, um, we still protect the body. Is there a difference there between how someone not on the path doesn't have this wisdom and someone who is deeply practicing would feel that self-preservation? And then is there also a difference with an enlightened being, a fully enlightened being, do they not have self-preservation instincts because they don't have wrong view of a permanent self, sir? Yeah, so what this comes down to is it comes down to reacting versus responding to something. So like that animal who's a deer out in the middle of the field, when a predator starts coming and they become aware of it, they react and they just take off in any old direction, you know, zigzagging around trying to lose this predator so that they don't get eaten. Right. And they're just reacting to the situation out of fear. And eventually, if they get safety, you know, they're they're breathing heavy, their hearts pounding, they're having all kinds of uh, anxiety and fear. And that's what actually kept them safe in that situation. And that's really all they have to keep them safe. Right. They can't reason with the lion and be like eh, do you really want to eat me like why are you wanting to do that you know that's not so wise you know why why are you interested in doing that right they that deer can't reason or rationalize with the lion about you know what's uh, about to transpire but in the human realm what we do is we tend to react as well in the unenlightened state right we have some fearful situation, there's that self there, there's that self-preservation. We react out of fear without thinking necessarily very clearly. And this is where people can sometimes react so ag aggressively that they might end up uh, overdoing it and killing somebody and end up in jail for the rest of their life when in reality it was like, you know, the backfire of a car. It sounded like a gunshot, but this mind reacted in such a way that they might have even end up murdering this person, right? Or hitting somebody so so aggressively or something like this. If somebody steals something from you, they might attack this person out of a reaction uh, rather than responding. So as somebody evolves with these teachings and that craving, anger, and ignorance is either reduced or eliminated, you can still find that, yes, you will uh, protect this physical body, but you'll do it through responding to the situation rather than reacting out of hostility and aggression and where the mind is you know overactive the the heart's pumping the the breathing is really heavy instead you just realize how to function in the world more peacefully and when it comes to kind of protection of this physical body there's actually a whole lot of other things you can do before you get to that point. There's a whole lot of decisions that led up to a situation where there's a confrontation at 2 a.m. in front of a bar, right? In order for that to occur, then there was a whole lot of decisions that a person made to go out at a certain time of night, to visit a certain type of venue, to be associating with certain type of friends. You know, there's a whole lot of decisions that are made to for that person to be standing outside of a bar at 2 a.m. and get shot uh, and killed there was a whole lot of decisions that went into that. So with wisdom of the natural law of gamma, there's a whole lot of decisions you can make to ensure that you're never in that situation to begin with. But if you're in a situation where something like that occurs, then if you've eliminated or at least diminished craving anger and ignorance, you can make wise decisions and respond to the situation to protect the physical body rather than reacting in a way that's going to actually cause more problems or be pr more problematic for you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the final question for right now, um, kind of to stem off of that towards the ego, to not put ourselves, ourselves, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, above or below anyone, should we just see all beings as equal or just cut off that whole comparison entirely and just see beings as being stiff. Yeah, both of those are actually really helpful is that wherever you see the mind wanting to put itself above others with arrogance and pride is cut that off, let it go and see yourself as just being equal. Or if you see yourself putting yourself below other people and kind of looking up to with like such admiration that you can't even function around this person, 
you know, that is detrimental to the mind. If you admire somebody's conduct or if you admire somebody's speech or you admire that they've cultivated certain skills and you're like, wow, I would like to cultivate some of those same qualities for my life. You know, that's one thing is that you have this admiration for this person and you feel that they're a decent role model for you and you would like to kind of adopt some of those same qualities and those same thinking. That's one thing. But when we put ourselves below others and look up with such, um, you know, all in the mind where you're all struck, like I think about like if you've ever met a certain celebrity that you just had all this admiration for and you just looked up to them uh, as being so high, you couldn't even put together words and speak in a certain way around this person. Uh, this would be detrimental to your ability to be successful in the world, not just with a celebrity, but if like there was a boss and you just uh, looked up to this boss in such a way that anytime you're around them, you kind of lost your thinking and you weren't able to kind of put two words together and speak in a uh, in a way that would be able to allow you to conduct your daily task. This would be detrimental to your life in terms of having a professional career. So when you let go of any kind of fear or any kind of looking at someone as being below you, or I'm sorry, above you, then in those situations, you can be calm and peaceful. So yes, not judging others and trying to say like, oh, they're unwholesome or oh, they're wholesome or they're, they're better than me or I'm better than them or they think they're so great. Getting to a point where you just view all beings as equal and in order to get there, you're going to need to have this mindfulness or this awareness of mind where you see this conceit or this arrogance or this pride or this mind wanting to have a pecking order where you see that occurring, cut that off and let it go. And that's why I present this particular chapter in this way is that when you understand that this is an animalistic behavior of wanting a pecking order, then you can identify it and then be like, nope, I don't need that because we're human beings and we're all equal. So there's gonna to need to be this active role of applying right effort where you're cutting off and letting go of the mind wanting to have a pecking order and realize that you're in the human realm and you don't need that pecking order anymore and it's detrimental to your relationships. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Yes, sir, Tonka asked is is it always coming from personal existence and conceit if we feel uncomfortable around other people? Not necessarily. It can be any number of craving, desire, attachments. So if somebody is just, um, you know, singing a song that you don't like, if you have a craving to hear certain music and this song that they're singing is disagreeable, uh, that's because of the craving, desire, attachment. It's always going to be craving, desire, attachment when the mind is uncomfortable. But whether it's personal existence view or conceit or uh, central desire, any of those 10 fetters that are in the mind, it's going to be one of those 10 fetters. But which one it is, is determined on what's actually happening. Thank you, sir. Brandon asks, does the animal realm include all lower beings such as insects? Uh, such as insects, is that what you said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're about to talk about that now, that the animal realm is, you know, dogs, cats, birds, uh, spiders, uh, snakes, insects, all of these things that we have different names for. These are just different type of animal existences, but they're all within the animal realm. Thank you, sir. That's all the questions at this time, sir. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about the different realms and what's experienced in these different realms. And keep in mind what I shared just before we had questions is that these realms are shared in order for you to understand what true reality is, not as a way to incentivize you or motivate you to learn and practice the teachings, um, not as a way to guilt, shame, or fear you into learning the teachings, but just to help you understand true reality of what you're experiencing as a bigger picture. Because so far we've been talking about craving, anger, and ignorance, and a lot of uh, that aspect in this program so far, and helping you understand that the problem that the mind's experiencing is these pollutions of mind 
in this discontentedness that the mind is trapped in the unenlightened state. But the bigger problem that beings are experiencing is the cycle of rebirth. So understanding these five realms can help you in a number of different ways. Is <clears throat> One thing is, is that if you thought that you only ever had one life and you started having residual memories of past lives, you might think that you're going crazy and you might end up in a mental hospital and thinking that you're crazy because if you truly believe and have the misunderstanding that you only have one life but yet you're remembering maybe as a child in a past life that you were in a car accident flipped off of a bridge and drowned in the ocean or drowned in a river then these memories can be very disturbing to you but if you understand that they're from a past life you can just let that go and just realize that that's a past life or if you have these residual memories of all these different animal existences and they're starting to bubble up to the surface as your mind is awakening and the pollution of mind is starting to be eradicated from the mind and you're starting to have this bubbling up effect of residual memories of any of these other realms it can really shake you up if you're not aware that these are just residual memories. And then the other side of this is that if you're not aware of these other realms, particularly the formless realms, like heaven, the afflicted spirits, and the hell realm, and you're starting to get communication from beings in these realms, then once again, you could get really shaken up by that, not realizing the truth of what's really occurring is as you eliminate more and more pollution out of the mind and the mind starts awakening, you can very easily have residual memories of past lives and you can very easily start having communication from beings in these other realms. And this is completely normal. But if you didn't understand that that was normal, it can really shake you up. So I'll share with you guys these various realms and helping you to understand them. The first thing to understand is that when we talk about realms, it's not like these realms are in completely different places. Like oftentimes people associate the heavenly realm as being really far up in the sky, far, far away from us. Or they envision the hell realm is like deep down in the core of the earth with all this burning uh, magma or something like this. Instead, it's important to understand that while we call them realms or we call them worlds like the heavenly world or the human world, these are actually just existences in the same time and space. So right now, sitting in this chair is a human being. But when I get up and leave, there could be a spider that comes and sits here. There could be an ant that comes and sits here. Uh, just like an animal, right? Any kind of animal, a physical form of an animal could come and sit here because this realm of the animal realm is in the same time and space as us. And the hell realm, afflicted spirits, and heavenly realm is also in the same time and space as us. So just like a human can sit in this chair, just like an animal can be in this chair, there could also be a hell being in this chair at some point. There could be an afflicted spirit in this chair at some point, and there can be a heavenly being in this chair at some point. So if you envision that these realms are really far away in this distant world, then if you ever come in contact with any of these beings, it can potentially shake you up because there is the ability to be able to see some of these beings, even though they're formless, they can take on a presence where you can actually see an apparition of these beings. So if you either see any of these beings like you know heavenly being afflicted spirit or hell being or an animal which you've seen many of but you're not shaken up by an animal because they have physical form and you're kind of used to them but these formless beings it's very normal for them to be around and it's very normal for them to be able to communicate with us as well so you don't need to be shaken up when these things occur if you are shaken up or you're having difficulties when these things occur, you can always reach out to me or other members of our community and we'll help you through it and help you understand that this is just completely normal. So this heavenly realm that we're talking about is essentially just heavenly beings that exist in the same time and space as us. They're formless beings, meaning they don't have physical form and they only experience pleasant feelings. Where in the human realm and other realms, we experience all three feelings. Here in the heavenly realm, they only experience exclusively pleasant feelings. So happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. They can cultivate their consciousness to attain enlightenment, but they oftentimes lack motivation to do so. 
So in that heavenly realm, they oftentimes become complacent. Even though they can attain enlightenment, they oftentimes don't do the work to attain enlightenment. So because the heavenly realm is not permanent, they can be reborn down into the other realms, into hell, animal, afflicted spirits, or even into the human realm. So it's not a permanent existence in the heavenly realm. Despite what you might have been taught in other types of traditions, when you look around and you understand the universal truth of impermanence, it's not like everything around us is impermanent, but yet this heavenly realm is permanent. So the heavenly realm is still existing in the cycle of rebirth. It's not eternal. It's not the goal of what you're looking to accomplish because in that heavenly realm, if you exist in that heavenly realm or if you have existed, there was complacency there. And those beings oftentimes don't get to enlightenment, even though they have the potential and the ability, they lack motivation and they're oftentimes complacent because of these exclusive pleasant feelings. In the human realm, we experience all three aspects of discontentedness, pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. And we have the ability to cultivate the consciousness to get to enlightenment in this human existence. This human existence tends to be the most ideal existence for people to get to enlightenment because we have this built-in motivation. We experience pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. So those painful feelings of anger, sadness, frustration, and others tend to be this built-in motivation for us to get out of this cycle of rebirth and to get to enlightenment. Not everybody understands that, of course, but as we start learning about this, we start to you know, decide that we would like to eliminate these painful feelings. So before you ever learn anything about the Buddhist teachings, you might have been experiencing anger or sadness or frustration. And at some point along the line, you were like, you know, maybe I should do something about this. And you start looking for answers. And that tends to be the motivation that we then kind of start entering into learning and practicing in order to get to enlightenment. So the human existence is the ideal existence to actually get to enlightenment because we have this built-in motivation. The afflicted spirits realm, they experience exclusively painful feelings and neither painful nor pleasant. They don't experience any pleasant feelings, but they don't have the ability to cultivate their mind and actually get to enlightenment in that existence. These beings tend to have an extensive amount of craving, desire, attachment. They tend to hold on to people, possessions, material objects, places or situations that they've been involved in. If you've ever heard about someone who was maybe building a house and then maybe they died abruptly when the house wasn't completed yet, and then people might say, oh, this ghost is haunting this house. Well, essentially what it is is they're just holding on to this house and they have such craving and desire that they're not able to let go. And they've been reborn into this afflicted spirits realm, which some people refer to as hungry ghosts or ghosts. This is because of their craving, desire, attachment. They have so much of that that they are holding on to people, places, and possessions. <clears throat> and they can't evolve their consciousness enough to get to enlightenment in that existence. They would need to move into a human existence or a heavenly existence in order to cultivate the mind in order to get to enlightenment and end the whole cycle of rebirth. So they're just holding on and holding on and holding on. And this is why we say they're haunting a certain place or a certain location. They're not really haunting it. They're just existing in that place. And they haven't quite figured out that they're no longer human or they're no longer an animal or what have you. And they need to just let go and move on from that existence. The animal existence or the animal realm these beings experience pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant, but they're unable to cultivate their consciousness to get to enlightenment. You know, a, a dog can't learn the Four Noble Truths. They can't learn the Eightfold Path. They can't, you know, cultivate the consciousness enough to get to enlightenment in that existence. They can evolve, they can grow, but they can't evolve enough to actually end the cycle of rebirth. So every animal 
is going to need to be count, be born countless times in that animal realm to get to an improved rebirth where they're then able to improve their ability to get to a human or heavenly existence. So an animal like a lion or a tiger, you know, they're constantly killing just to survive. They're uh, having sexual misconduct. They're also stealing, right? Stealing food and things like this. They're fighting, they're aggressive. So their lives tend to be fairly short. You know, I think a, a natural life for a lion is about eight to 12 years. Um, that's kind of like what a lion would typically live because they're constantly killing. They have a shorter lifespan. This is part of the natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught. You can see this as it relates to human beings, and you can see this as it relates to all other beings as well. These natural laws don't just affect you if you're aware of them. They affect all beings. So in the animal realm, beings, if you're, say, like a turtle or like an elephant, these beings don't tend to kill very often. They're not very aggressive typically in terms of killing, and they tend to eat plants. They don't have to kill for their survival. So if you were a snake or a lion or something like this, you'd have to be countless times being reborn over and over and over again until you get to an improved animal rebirth that then has the ability to then get into the human realm. And then as beings are born into the human realm, their mind is oftentimes very much affected from those countless rebirths in the animal realm. So this is where in the human realm, you can see people who are murderous or who steal, who have extensive amounts of sexual misconduct. This is all because of the conditioning from our animal existences. Even though somebody is human, they're still functioning very much like an animal. So animals are essentially surviving with these basic survival instincts there's some learned behavior that they learn, but they really don't have motivation to get to enlightenment because they don't even necessarily know what that is. And they don't have the capability of the mind to cultivate it to the point where they can get to enlightenment. So they're just operating through these basic survival instincts, and then they're just living out whatever life that they have. Then the hell realm, these beings are also formless as well. They only experience exclusively painful feelings. They have no ability to cultivate the consciousness to get to enlightenment. They have extensive, extensive, high degree amounts of craving, desire, attachments. They have anger, hatred, ill will, and this ignorance or delusion or unknowing of true reality. And this is what's led them to the hell realm. And now once they're in this realm, they're going to need to do an extensive amount of experiencing painful feelings until they get to the point until they get to the point where they've improved their chances to get to an animal rebirth or uh, something beyond that. The Buddha explains the hell realm in the animal realm as like being stuck in a prison because there's so many countless rebirths that need to occur in the hell realm and in the animal realm before you have a chance to get to some better existence. The Buddha himself talked about countless animal existences that he had prior to getting into the human realm. And this is the reason why he describes it as a prison. So if you ever observe your past lives and all these countless animal existences that you've been, you might have had maybe just one or two, or maybe this is your first human existence where you've had just countless, countless animal existences. The Buddha describes that we've had so many existences in the past that all the tears that we've cried in those past existences equals more water than all of the sea, or the blood that we've had in those previous existences is more than all the volume of all the sea, or the mother's milk that we drink is more than all the water in all the seas. And if you understand the evolution of species in this earth, then you understand how this is entirely possible. Because while we say that it's the year 2022, and that's relatively a short period of time, that's only been based on the recent counting that we've been able to get to the point in humanity where we've been able to count the number of years. But scientists tell us that the Earth has been in existence for at least about 4.5 billion years. 
You know, they say between four to, to five billion years with a B, right? We can't even imagine that amount of time. Five billion years or four billion years because our existence is usually between 60 to 100 years. It's kind of like what a human being lives for. That's like such a blink of an eye compared to four or five billion years. So with all of this evolution of beings that have existed for all these millions and millions and millions and millions of years, it's very easy to see how we could have accumulated enough rebirths that our tears or our blood or the mother's milk has accumulated to be more than all the water than all in all of the sea. So we've been count, countless times being reborn over and over and over in this cycle of rebirth. And getting to enlightenment is how you escape this whole cycle. And you'll be able to see that that's occurring as the discontentedness is gradually diminishing and you're starting to function more and more like a human being. Let me see what questions you guys have on these five realms. You can ask those through Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom electronically to ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir. Rick has a question. Thank you, sir. Um, for the three feline critters who reside with me, what can I do in my practices to help them to cultivate the conscious necessary to bring them closer to enlightenment? So all the animals that we have that are living side by side with human beings, that's a highly improved animal existence comparative to being a snake out in the forest or a tiger out in the forest, for example, because the pets that we have, they don't have to fight. They don't have to kill. They don't have to steal uh, in order for them to get their food. That's a huge improvement for them. And oftentimes when we have domesticated animals, we don't allow them to breed or we uh, do surgery in order for them to kind of not breed. Um, so these kind of things are already improving their ability to get to an improved rebirth just by living side by side with human beings. We kind of treat them in ways that helps them to move away from a lot of the animalistic instincts that they would have had if they were wild animals out in the forest. Um, but just functioning as a human being and being loving and kind and compassionate, they also adopt some of these things as well because before they were domesticated, you know, they were wild animals, but now being domesticated and living side by side with a human being, they're starting to adopt some of the qualities of a human being. Uh, this is where we can see animals that function very much similar to the people that they live side by side with. So just you functioning as you would normally care for an animal, this is already going to be you know, very helpful for them. So as they don't have to fight for food, as they uh, are learning to be more loving and kind, as they're not killing, stealing, having sexual misconduct, this is all leading to an improved rebirth for them, potentially in the human realm or the heavenly realm after their animal existence. Thank you, Teacher David. Just a, a follow up on that question. Is there anything uh, else that I can do by way of communication with, my, with the animals that live with me? There's nothing that you need to actively do other than what you're already going to do, right? You're already going to be loving and kind and warm uh, with them. So they're just going to adopt that. So by you practicing what it is that you're learning, you know, you're going to be functioning more and more like an enlightened being and they're going to be experiencing that. So you don't have to take this real active role of like, you know, should I have my cat, you know, meditate before they eat or, you know, something like this, you know, just be normal and do what it is that you normally do. They're going to adopt a lot of uh, that kind of learning from being around humans. They're, that's what it means to be domesticated, um, where you're not interested in promoting the wildness of the animal existence, right? Like I, I was just talking to a student recently and they have... I think their dog rings a bell before they go to the bathroom. You know, like this is, you know, highly evolved animal to be able to ring a bell to let the people know that they need to go out to the bathroom outside. You know, uh, uh, 
a, a cow can't necessarily do that. A horse can't necessarily do that. But these animals that we have living with us, we train them in such a way that, you know, as they growl and they roar, we teach them not to do that. Um, so there's already things like that that you're doing, Rick. I don't think you have to put a whole lot of thought into how to help your pets get to an improved rebirth. Instead, put that effort into you learning how to become more enlightened so that you can get to enlightenment. And as you do that, everything else will trickle to them and help them to evolve. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Is Teacher David Miranda has a question? Thank you, Tony. Um, Teacher David, I've thought of afflicted spirits or ghosts as simply being human beings without a physical body. Is this a wise way to think about the, these beings? And then also, would this be a wise way to think about beings in the heavenly and hell realms? Or is there a different way to be thinking about these beings, sir? I think of these beings as completely different beings, you know, different realms. I think it helps to, to really have that delineation there. This is where, you know, some people think of human beings as being animals and they, their mind gets a little bit confused. I would look at them as, you know, very distinct uh, beings, different beings, rather than um, trying to associate them with another realm because beings in that afflicted spirit realm can come from the animal realm as well and having never been a human being before whereas if you associate the afflicted spirits realm with human beings then your mind would tend to think that only uh, beings that have been human can be afflicted spirits but actually beings from the hell realm from the animal realm and even the heavenly realm can also become an afflicted spirit as well so i would think of them as being completely distinct uh, realms Okay, yes, that makes sense. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yes, Teacher David. Um, so you're talking about the five realms. What is the enlightened realm? Is that a, a realm on its own, or, or what is the enlightened? Say that again. I say, well, what is the, the, is there a realm once you get to no rebirth, so the enlightened state? Oh, what, I, is that a, a realm? I see. What, what is that? Yeah, so there's these five realms of existence of this is the cycle of rebirth that if you're in existence, you're in one of these realms. Once the mind gets to enlightenment, say like somebody's a human being and they get to enlightenment, they're still a human being at that point. It's just that their mind has been cultivated to the point where now their mind is enlightened. It's, it's eliminated craving, anger, and ignorance. It's eradicated all the pollution. They're still a human being, but once they die, what happens next is an undeclared teaching. The Buddha didn't describe what happens next once somebody attains enlightenment and dies. So there, uh, there isn't a teaching that declares or explains what happens next. Okay, so it's not like you don't, you're not reborn. You're definitely not reborn. Definitely not reborn. Yeah, you're definitely not reborn in the cycle of rebirth into one of these five uh, realms. There's no longer existence in one of these five realms. This is one of the confusions and misunderstandings that you see in the world about Buddhist teachings. Some people say that once you attain enlightenment and you die, that there's nothing else after that. Um, because what the Buddha explains in one part of his teachings, he explains that once you attain enlightenment, there's no further existence. But when you see what he talks about, about existence, he talks about existence in the five realms. But then in another part of his teachings, he says that he's leaving it as an undeclared teaching about once somebody attains enlightenment and then they die, he doesn't declare whether they exist whether they don't exist, whether they neither exist nor don't exist, or whether they both exist or don't exist. He leaves it as a completely undeclared teaching. And if you read far enough into this book series, when we get to that point in the book series, I explain some thoughts around why the Buddha left this as an undeclared teaching. So a person's not going to exist in the cycle of rebirth once they attain enlightenment, but whether they exist or they don't exist after death, having attained enlightenment. This is just a completely undeclared teaching. Okay, uh, follow up, sort of a follow-up question on that. 
uh, I had a, a, a couple of relatives that almost had a near-death experience, and they said that there was this light, and then they got brought back through through our great medical procedures that are available now. Uh, would this be? There is uh, does the Buddha have any impact on, on teachings on this? That's sort of nirvana or uh, lights that people see in the calm that people see when they approach the death. He didn't talk about that as far as I know. I haven't seen any teachings along that line of explaining that or uh, that that occurs or what that may or may not be. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That's all the questions. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to the next thing that I was going to share with you guys in terms of kind of these residual memories coming up in the mind about uh, previous uh, births. So, um, as the mind awakens, as you're doing the work to understand and practice the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and all the other teachings, and this pollution starts being eliminated from the mind, it's not uncommon for somebody to observe past lives um, at different points in their life. If you've experienced deja vu, where you have had memories of things that have happened to you, but you know that they weren't in this life, this is a residual memory that's kind of coming to the surface. But you can actually have memories that are even more profound than this. Not everybody experiences this, but some people do and some people don't. The way that I help you understand it is that if you were in your house and you walked out of your house or whatever building you're in, if you walked out of that building, you can only see the street that you're on. You looking up and down the street, you know what's happening on that street. But if you move to a higher vantage point where you're maybe up on top of a mountain, uh, overlooking a particular city, you can see all the streets in that city and you can kind of generally see what's happening on all those streets. You might even be able to see different towns and how these different towns connect to each other. This is essentially what's happening as the mind eliminates the pollution of mind and it evolves to this higher consciousness. As the mind is moving to this higher and higher consciousness, you're able to see sometimes more and more of what is transpiring in this life, but also in previous lives as well. So when we're kind of stuck in a rut, so to speak, we might only be able to see this one problem that we're focusing on so intensely. But as you start cultivating this wisdom about the path to enlightenment and you're training the mind, you start being able to see your life from a bigger picture. And you kind of start seeing how that argument that you had 10 years ago that ended the relationship with someone who was really close to you, you start realizing that even though up to this point you've been blaming the other person for it, as you evolve to this higher consciousness, you can start seeing how yeah, I caused that. That was based on my craving, my anger, and my ignorance. You start getting this insight to what's been transpiring in this life. But as you evolve to this higher consciousness, you can also get insight into what's transpired in other lives as well. So there's no need to be shaken up by this or confused by it. If it starts happening, you're welcome to reach out and get help if you'd like. But essentially, the answer is keep meditating Keep training the mind on the Eightfold Path. Keep eliminating the pollution of mind and bring the mind into the present moment, realizing that you're no longer any of those beings. So as those residual memories come to the surface, if you understand that it's just completely normal and you just keep with your practice, then it won't shake you up and you won't have any concerns about it. You'll just see that it's completely normal. In terms of talking about how the mind moves from these animal uh, uh, existences to the human existence, it's important to understand that the vast majority of beings that exist in the human realm are being reborn out of the animal realm. This is why we are so infatuated with animals. Human beings have this, you know, almost obsession with animals. We're so fascinated with animals. We have zoos, we have pets in our home, we study about animals, we're just so intrigued with nature. In fact, as we grow up as kids, we have stuffed animals. Uh, we keep lots of stuffed animals around us. Uh, we even wear animal prints on our clothes oftentimes as we're going through life uh, because of our fascination with the animal realm because there's those memories, even though someone might not uh, have it consciously and they might not say it consciously that they understand that they were many different animals in the past. But because that 
has occurred, this is what fosters and kind of incubates our obsession and our fascination with the animal realm because of these countless animal existences. The unenlightened human mind functions very much like an animal. We oftentimes lack memory just in the unenlightened state. We lack memory just like in the human realm. We tend to kind of know about things that have happened in the last five or 10 years or so. But going back to your childhood, your memory is just kind of spotty. You know, you kind of remember a couple of things here and there. But by and large, most of your memories are within kind of the recent uh, past, uh, just like an animal. We also function very much in the human realm through a praise and reward where we have certain behaviors and we do certain things. And when we get a certificate or we get a reward, we really revel in that. We really like that. And that's what we do with animals in order to train animals. If we see certain behaviors that we like, you know, we give them food or we kind of rub them on the head or we tell them good boy, good girl, or whatever it is that we share with them because we're trying to incentivize this behavior that we give this praise or we give this reward to animals. And they work, they function very well through that. That's how we've domesticated certain animals because of the praise and reward system, kind of guiding them towards improved behavior. And we have that same thing in the human realm is that when we get a certificate for something that we've accomplished, wow, we really like that, we really revel in that. Or if somebody tells us, oh, you did a really good job with that, um, you know, we really revel in that. Or if somebody gives us some candy or some food or something like this, we really revel in that because the mind functions in the unenlightened state very much like an animal appreciating this praise and reward system. We also have this learned behaviors versus these instinctive behaviors, where as we were growing up as wolves, we had certain instinctive behaviors, but then we also learned certain things from other wolves, how to be a wolf, or we learned how to be a lion or, or an elephant or something like this. So in those animal existences, we learned from similar species in our pack of how to be that particular species. And we do the same thing in the human realm is that as we grow, as we're born and then we start growing, we actually learn from other human beings how to be a human being. So if we have a family who is very wholesome and very kind and very loving, then we tend to grow up and learn how to do those things because we've learned from the more influential people around us how to function in that way. But if we've learned and been around people that have been aggressive or hostile or bitter uh, and harsh, then that's what we learned growing up because we were surrounded by those types of human beings. And we kind of took our cues and we learned this behavior from these other similar uh, animals, uh, or I'm sorry, these similar beings that were human beings, but they might have been functioning through craving, anger, and ignorance. So if we're around human beings that are functioning through craving, anger, and ignorance, if we don't have the wisdom to understand this and choose to do something different, then we oftentimes function through that same craving, that same anger, that same ignorance. This is where children grow up and kind of adopt the same qualities as what they see being modeled by their parents. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important that as a parent that you model these teachings really well because your children are going to take their cues from you. Your son's going to learn how to be a man through uh, their father or they're uh, going to learn how to treat a woman through how they treat their mother. And a daughter is going to learn how to be a woman through their uh, through their mother, through their grandmother, through their aunts and people like this. And they're going to learn how to have relationships with men through their relationship with their father, or their uncles or their grandfather, their brothers and things like this. So we learn from these other human beings around us very much like uh, animals do. Even though human beings don't necessarily by and large understand the cycle of rebirth and that we have been countless animals in the past, we actually do have certain phrases that we use in our language that kind of shows us that we do have a certain level of understanding of our previous existences and this cycle of rebirth. We have phrases that when, you know, someone's acting really aggressive or harsh, we might say, oh, you're acting like an animal. Or you might say, you're fighting like cats and dogs. 
right? Even though we're in this human realm, we will maybe sometimes say that about two people who are arguing and fighting and bickering. You know, you're fighting like cats and dogs, or you're acting like an animal. And this is really helpful for you to identify with your own conduct, is that where you see yourself functioning like an animal, is to understand that you're trying to purge that behavior. You're trying to eliminate that conduct and become this better and better human being. Because as long as you keep arguing and bickering and being aggressive and hostile and roaring at people, this is keeping the mind in this uh, animal consciousness where you're not evolving to become this better and better human being. So these animal consciousness in the animal existence is preoccupied with this craving anger and ignorance. You know, we play, we fight, we have sex, we eat, we hunt, all of these things in animal existence. <clears throat> in the human existence, what we need to do is be able to cultivate the consciousness and gain this wisdom to evolve beyond these animal existence into more and more of an enlightened mind where we're shedding these animal instincts and we're letting go of this unenlightened consciousness and evolving to being this wiser human being who makes wise decisions about things around us and what we're choosing to do. This path to enlightenment is what's helping us to do that. What's evolving, what's allowing us to evolve from animal consciousness to human consciousness is learning and practicing the teachings by not believing them, but by learning, reflecting and practicing. This is what helps to eliminate the difficulties of being in an animal existence, because living out in the forest and dealing with the elements of weather and ticks and bugs and fighting and not knowing where your next meal is coming from and having to kill or steal and all these other things. This is a really hard way to live life and to do that countless times over and over again. So evolving from animal to becoming more and more human is to evolve past all these difficulties. Understanding that by cultivating wisdom, it leads to enlightenment and ending this whole cycle of rebirth so that you be, can become more and more human and experience better, better existence in the human realm by coexisting with others more peacefully. As long as you're having difficulties with the people around you and you're not able to exist peacefully or harmoniously with others, the mind is still functioning very much like an animal. So if you're annoyed by somebody, this is the mind annoying itself. Or if you get irritated or frustrated with others around you, this is because they're still craving anger and ignorance in the mind. And you've got to shed all of that. You've got to eliminate the pollutions and purify the mind so that you can live peacefully and harmoniously with other beings and know that, that's, that you're capable of doing that as the mind gets to becoming more and more enlightened. What you see in the world and the condition of our planet is a direct result of the beings coming out of the animal realm and becoming human. Because unenlightened minds in the human realm are functioning with craving, anger, and ignorance, as you see all the problems that exist in the world, it can all be traced back to craving, anger, and ignorance. So if you turn on the news or if you read some publication that's talking about murder or rape or uh, drug use or uh, any kind of number of problems, even war, you know, global conflict, this is all coming from craving, anger, and ignorance. This is the mind craving, you know, I want a certain land. And if you don't give me this land, I'm going to attack you and exert all this anger and hostility until you submit and give me what I want, right? This is animalistic behaviors. Because as an animal, if another animal doesn't give us what we want, we roar and we growl and we fight and we inflict damage on this other being until they eventually give us what we want. So as human beings, we're functioning in the same way through this craving, anger, and ignorance, even with something like a war where somebody may want to conquer a certain land, if this other person doesn't give me what I want, then I'm gonna take it by force and I'm gonna inflict as much damage as possible on these people until they submit and give me what I want. 
And this all needs to be purged from the mind because as long as the mind is doing this, we're going to continue to see problems in our local level, in our uh, you know countries, and in global conflict that beings are going to be constantly fighting and arguing with each other based on their cravings of wanting something for their own selfish desires. And when those selfish desires don't get fulfilled, then there's going to be this anger and hostility until you give me what I want, or I just learn and gain wisdom to understand that I can't always get what I want. So this craving and anger is going to continue to persist in the human mind and cause continuous problems in the world until beings arise wisdom in order to eliminate that ignorance or unknowing of true reality. As more and more beings in the world arise wisdom and understand craving and anger and the difficulties that it's causing, all being traced back to countless animal existences, then we're going to continue to see countless problems in the world. But while those problems are going on, you can still evolve your consciousness and you can cultivate this wisdom, eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance, and getting to a more peaceful existence in this human realm. So as each human decides to walk towards the light rather than reside in the darkness, then the planet can become a more and more peaceful place to exist. But if people choose to reside with craving, anger, and ignorance, essentially staying in the darkness, then if beings aren't walking towards the light, then they're going to experience a lot of difficulties and struggles in their life. So the way to solve this in your own life is move away from these animalistic instincts, these uh, conditioning of mind that has occurred over countless rebirths, and realize that what you're on a path to do is, yes, cultivate wisdom and purify the mind. But in doing that, you're becoming a better and better human being, is functioning through wisdom and wise decision makings. And that's what's going to lead to improved outcomes for yourself. So this is everything that I had to share with you guys today. I'll just open up to any questions that you guys might have. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir. Shantana asks, would you please give me an example of when the mind is moving to a higher and higher consciousness? Is, is it like Jana, more calm? Yeah, what you'll see is you'll see the mind will become more calm in certain situations where you might have gotten frustrated or angry or irritated. Those things are no longer shaking up the mind, that those same things can occur and the mind understands why they're occurring and it can be quite peaceful. So maybe in the past where you might make an appointment with somebody and that person doesn't show up at the designated time and you might get really angry at that person and your mind was really discontent in that situation where maybe now that you understand the universal truth of impermanence and you understand that it's not possible for everyone that you schedule an appointment with to show up on time that now when this person shows up 10 or 15 minutes late instead of being angry and hostile maybe you just have loving kindness and compassion you say is everything okay um, was your travel okay? You know, how's things going at home? You know, you might show more care and more concern where in the past there was this anger that arose. So as you're purifying the mind and you're starting to cultivate this wisdom, you'll start seeing that the way you function in situations is very different than what you experienced in the past. And because of that, there'll be more calmness and composure in the mind and things won't shake up your mind. Thank you, sir. Uh, Shantana also asks, in the book, page 339, saying, we influence others through our own intentions, speech, and actions, not through telling others what to do. Is this, is, is this apply to all beings, including children? It is hard not to tell kids what to do, sir. It is hard not to tell children not to do things, sir. Sure. So it's important to delineate our roles in society. So in terms of like our neighbor or coworker or life partner, or things like this, we shouldn't be in a position where we're trying to control that person or tell them what to do because they're adults and they need to be able to make wise decisions for themselves. 
But with children, we need to guide them to making wise decisions. Still, we shouldn't think about it as we're trying to control our children because that's where the craving and anger is going to come in. Instead, we need to guide them to making wise decisions. So we shouldn't ever be trying to control other beings, whether it's adults or children. But with children, we need to sometimes restrain them from certain evils that might uh, you know, impact them based on their lack of wisdom and understanding what it is that they're interacting or what they're about to uh, do, they might not have the foresight or the wisdom to understand what they're about to do. So as parents, the Buddha describes that, you know, we should restrain our children from evil. But with that said, there are going to be situations where you need to actively teach your child. And one of the best ways to teach them is through sitting down with them, asking them questions, helping them see the decisions that they're making and help them see that the decisions that they're making aren't leading to the best outcomes. Because just being told what to do isn't helping them to arise wisdom. You know, if they're just a robot, being told what to do, they're not developing the wisdom about how to make wise decisions. So as I was describing to Amina's question, rather than trying to rush in and fix things for our children or tell them what to do, instead, if they're not doing something that is wise, if they're making unwise decisions, this is because they're lacking wisdom of how to make that wise decision. So us just jumping in and telling them what to do, or us just jumping in and doing it for them, isn't fixing the problem. Instead, we need to take a step back, sit down with our child, help them to cultivate the wisdom so that when they encounter that situation in the future, they have the wisdom on board that they need in order to make that decision for themselves in the future. Because we are impermanent in their life as parents. We're completely impermanent. We can't be in their life permanently. Even while we're alive, we can't be there with them every single moment. So what we can do, though, is while we do spend time with them and when we're spending time with them, is help them to cultivate wisdom so that when they're in that situation, then they're more likely to make that decision based on their wisdom. And one of the best ways to help children arise wisdom is to ask them questions and lead them to understanding. I was just with Bailan uh, tonight and I was eating downstairs. I was eating some salsa and chips and he was next to me eating a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he started talking about some topic. Um, and I know he watches YouTube a lot. So I said to him, I said, Bailan, I said, is everything that you watch on YouTube the truth? Uh, is everything that you see on YouTube the truth? And he knows enough about the universal truth of impermanence that he said, no, not everything I watch on YouTube is the truth. I said, okay. Well, when you're interested in knowing the truth, how do you know whether something is the truth or not? He said, well, I usually look at it on Google or I watch Netflix. And I said, okay, well, is everything that you, that you see on Google the truth? And he was like, well, they sure do know a lot on Google. And I was like, yeah, they, they, there is a lot on Google, but is everything that you see on Google the truth? He said, nope, it can't be everything, can't be the truth. And I was like, what about Netflix? Is everything on Netflix the truth? He's like, nope, it's sure not. And I said, well, how do you develop wisdom and how do you know what is the truth? And he's like, hmm, he's sitting there thinking about it for a little bit. And I said, um, is dad eating sauce and chips right now? He said, yeah, you're eating sauce and chips. And I said, well, how do you know that? He said, because I see you with my own eyes. I know that you're eating sauce and chips. I said, okay, so you know it's the truth that I'm eating sauce and chips. He said, yes, I know for sure that you're eating sauce and chips. I was like, well, how did you, how did you come to that conclusion? How do you know that's the truth? He said, because I can see it with my own eyes. I said, okay, so you have direct experience that you've seen it with your own eyes and that's how you know if something's the truth? He said, yes, that's how I know it's the truth is I have to see it with my own eyes. I said, okay, that sounds good. So instead of telling him, you know, everything you see on YouTube isn't the truth. You have to see it with your own eyes. You have to investigate it. Instead of kind of being preachy and lecturing to him, instead I knew what the answer was, that he needs to see it with his own eyes. And I just asked a series of questions that guided him to the answer. So if your child's lying, for example, instead of demoralizing them and, and being harsh and aggressive with them and 
uh, punishing them for lying. Instead, sit down with them and say, you know, is what you just told mom the truth or what you just told dad the truth? And they're like, mm, no, I didn't tell the truth. Why is it that you lied? I already know the answer. The reason why people lie is because of craving. They have certain selfish desires and they're lying in order to get to their selfish desires. So why is it that you lied? They're going to say, I don't know. I just wanted to eat chocolate and you wouldn't give it to me. So I went and ate it for myself and then I didn't want to get in trouble. So I lied to you about it. Okay. So is it wise to lie? You know, you, you start asking them questions, you know, you start talking to them about craving. You start talking to them about being honest and kind of leading them through questions to arise wisdom. And even still, you do that one time. It's not like they're going to learn everything they need to learn and then immediately start telling the truth in every situation. You're going to need to talk to them many, many times about lying and having discussions with them and help them to understand how this is unwise and show them examples of people in the news or people uh, in your community. Not that you're judging those people, but just showing them examples of where people have lied and then there's some unwholesome result and show them the examples of this and show them in the real world this natural law of gamma and how lying is impactful and how people lose their jobs, how people lose their reputation, how people uh, lose friends and ability to function in the world when they're lying, for example. So rather than just, you know, barking out orders like an animal would do to tell our children to stop lying. Instead, what we're trying to do is cultivate this wisdom in their mind so that they make the choice to not lie in the future. We're not trying to bark out orders and scare them and fear them like an animal into telling the truth because that's not going to work. Instead, we would like to cultivate this wisdom in their mind and help them to cultivate that wisdom that they can see that lying leads to unwholesome results. And oftentimes the best way to do that is to ask them questions and lead them to an answer through well-developed questions and kind of finessing it to the point where they come to the conclusion themselves and they're actually teaching themselves. And then just realize you're going to have to have patience or you're going to need patience in order to gradually walk them through these scenarios multiple times until they're able to consciously make wise decisions to not lie over a consistent long-term period of time. <laughs> Perfect for our class so today. Max, doesn't stand up. <laughs> Max uh, he turned it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so earlier you were talking about having obsessions with animals. Um, so I guess like my wife has obsession with animals or craving desire attachment to owning animals. And she's said, you know, someday she wants to own a horse or whatnot. And I guess I, uh, I'm can like the mind is concerned about, you know, if that's, you know, something that's not advised, or I guess that's not the right word, but I guess the difference between owning an animal to, just to own the animal as like a craving desire attachment uh, versus uh, like my mind would be more content with like rescuing an animal and, to, you know, to, to help an animal in need, I guess. Yeah, you can share those kind of things with your partner and then just leave it up to them to make whatever decision they're going to make. You know, oftentimes if you have a, you know, if a person has a certain uh, desire and then their partner wants to do something that we feel is unwise, we might try to force or control them not to do that. But instead, what it means to be a partner is that you give them suggestions, you give them advice, you give them thoughts. And you may even ask them before, you know, are you interested in my advice on this? Are you interested in my suggestions? And if they say no, then you'd be completely fine with that and you don't share it. But if they say yes, then you share your opinions and your views and then leave it to them to make whatever decision that they need to make. Because your partner needs to extinguish her cravings. And there's two ways to extinguish craving is either just to eliminate it 
or to fulfill it. So if she has a craving to own a horse and you blocked her from doing that or you tried to block her from doing that with wrong view, she's going to blame you for any anger that is arising. Instead, you can share your thoughts, share your opinions, give advice if she's open to it. And if she's not, you don't share it. And then whatever decision she makes, it's up to her. Um, because she's going to need to extinguish that craving, either eliminating it and realizing that maybe um, it's not wise for her for any number of reasons to not have a horse, um, or she's going to need to have a horse, realize how much work it is, and then uh, decide that, okay, this is done. I don't need to do this anymore. Uh, where we end up with conflict is when we're trying to control our partner to either do or not do a particular thing. And all we can do as a partner is share our advice, share our opinions, and then leave it to the other person to make whatever decisions they're going to make. Thank you, sir. I guess uh, whether it, I mean, besides the fact of her craving or whatnot, uh, I guess I don't know how to ask the question, but whether like if let's say i wanted well let's say i felt the need to own a pet or whatever just the the difference between going to like someone that's breeding them for a profit versus someone that's you know the animal is in danger or the animals you know needs rescuing or whatever um i guess i don't I guess I don't know my question, I guess, but just a, a matter of the mind being in the right place of owning animals. Yeah, so if you would like to have an animal, you know, that's your decision. That's something that you can choose to do. If you would like to go to a shelter and get an animal there, that's more advisable because you're not feeding the problem, which if you were going to a direct breeder, because of wrong livelihood, you know, that person doesn't understand, but they're, you know, causing harm in the world through that um, livelihood. So by you going to a, a shelter, yeah, that's helping to, to solve a problem. But so you can make those decisions for yourself in, in your own capacity based on decisions that you're making. But other people, you know, they're going to make decisions in whatever way or whatever capacity they're choosing to make those decisions. And that's where if you're choosing to to be with your wife uh, and she's choosing something different than what you would have choose chose that's where you need to just be comfortable with that and, and be, be okay with that but i think what your question is is what would be more advisable purchasing a, a pet from a breeder or going to a, a a a shelter and my advice would be if you're going to have a pet it would be better to go to a shelter but whether you choose to do that or not is, you know, your choice. Um, everybody's going to make that choice differently. And it's not that people who go to a shelter are so wonderful and people who go to a breeder are so bad. It's just a different choice. And the more that you understand about the natural laws of existence and you understand what the real problems are in the world, then your decisions will be informed by that wisdom. But then ultimately, whatever anybody chooses to do for their own life is their own decision. Yeah, I guess uh, so it would be, you know, buying from a breeder would be basically be supporting wrong livelihood versus buying from a shelter, which would be, you know, helping hum uh, helping other beings and so forth. Exactly. It would be showing loving kindness and compassion to those beings in the shelter so that they don't need to end up dying or living in a environment that is not really conducive to a, a healthy life so uh yes that that is exactly right is that if you understand right livelihood and that you're interested in having wholesome things happen in the world then someone who's interested in uh that has that wisdom and is interested in promoting wholesomeness in the world if they're interested in an animal they wouldn't go to a breeder um but Again, if somebody did go to a breeder, there's no judgment. There's no looking down on this person. It's just what they choose. You know, it's what they're choosing to do. Um, and they might have certain reasons why they're doing that. But, you know, at this point in my life, I wouldn't own any animals. Um, but, uh, you know, 
if somebody asked me, you know, what should I do? I, I, I'm definitely going to get an animal. You know, what option would I, should I take? I would say it's up to you. You know, here's the options. If you go to a breeder, this is what is happening because of that. This is what's happening because of the, you know, with the shelter and then whatever decision someone makes, it's totally up to them. That answers my questions. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, yes, sir. On Zoom, Chantana has a follow-up question. She asks, if you only, if you have to only choose one method to cultivate consciousness to gain wisdom, what would it be, sir? Uh, one way from the Noble Eightfold Path? There isn't one way uh, to cultivate the consciousness. It's not possible to 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 say just one way, right? Um, because there's so many things that you need to learn and practice in order to cultivate the consciousness. But in terms of if you only had ten minutes a day, what would I suggest you do? Is breathing mindfulness meditation. You know, that's the one thing that is going to produce the best results for you. But it's important to understand the the whole comprehensive approach that it's an entire path in picking just one thing um it's not going to get the mind to enlightenment but if all you had to do in this life was to establish right view if you were able to do that in understanding the four noble truths and establishing right view okay you know that would be ideal um and then from there doing breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation but those things alone isn't going to move the mind to enlightenment. Because if we do meditation and then we still have wrong speech, for example, then we're still going to be experiencing all these unwholesome results in our life. So it's important to ensure that you're approaching the whole path comprehensively. Start out with right view and establishing right view really well, not only understanding it intellectually, but in situations where you see the mind's discontent, get to the point where you understand that you're causing it yourself and identifying what those craving desire attachments are that are bringing that discontentedness up. So it's one thing to understand those four statements of the Four Noble Truths, but it's a whole other thing to practice it, that on a daily basis, that when you see discontentedness arising, trying to figure out what attachments or what cravings led to this. That's the real practice of the Four Noble Truths. And then all the other steps of the Eightfold Path uh, built on top of that. Thank you, sir. And then on YouTube, Molly asks, is it possible to help beings in other realms by making merit for them? This is actually a misunderstanding of the teachings of the Buddha. There's people who teach this type of thing in Buddhist communities, but it's not part of what the Buddha actually taught. So let's talk about what merit is and how it's beneficial then you'll be able to see the truth for yourself that it's not possible to help beings in other realms. What merit is, is merit is the practice of generosity, of giving and sharing towards teachers and temples and people who are sharing the teachings of the Buddha. And by you practicing generosity where you're giving and sharing your time, effort, energy, and resources in order to help the teachings of the Buddha reach more and more people, this is producing merit. This merit is wholesome karma or wholesome results based on your decision to uh, support the teachings to come into the world. That's one benefit. The other benefit is that you're working on eliminating craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing and strong eagerness to hold on to things very tightly. So the two benefits with merit is we, we support the teachings and allow them to come into the world more readily. And for you as an individual, you're eliminating craving, desire, attachment, training the mind to give and share so that you don't have selfishness. There's no way for you to transfer those benefits to another being in another realm. Although there's places in Buddhism that have gotten to a point where they do little ceremonies and they think that when you make an offering, you're transferring this to your dead relatives or something like this. This isn't actually true. If you, re if you study the words of the Buddha and you look in the world around you, you can see the truth for yourself. That when the Buddha taught about the natural law of karma, he said that any karma that you create, 
either wholesome or unwholesome. You are its heirs. You are the owner of that gamma. So you can't actually create gamma for other beings. And merit is just a unique type of gamma. So this is just a misunderstanding that exists in the world that you can transfer the benefits of merit to somebody else. But when you understand gamma and you understand merit and you understand that what's really happening is this benefit to bring the teachings into the world and this benefit for you to eliminate selfishness, then you realize that you can't transfer those benefits to anybody else. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. It does not appear to have any other questions at this time, sir. All right. Well, I will. Uh, yes, we do. And I had my hand raised, actually. I don't know what happened. Can I ask a question? Sure. We didn't see your hand raised, Rick. It didn't show up on Zoom. So um, you're it welcome. Was, it was up, but something happened. But anyway, yeah, um, I'll just ask very quickly, and I apologize ahead of time because we had trouble formulating the question. Um, Jacqueline asks on Facebook, she says, it's hard to grasp the realms that aren't in this existence. One can see the heavenly being in someone's rapture, hell in the craving of an addict, etc. And then she goes on to say, realms are being lived in this time in life, ignorance, unknowing of true reality. It's difficult to imagine a realm outside of this life. And then um, I see these realms being lived today in this world where I exist. It's not an exact question, but I was wondering if you could comment on any of this because she seems to be having trouble grasping the realms of existence. Yeah, what I would say, and I was going to share this as part of the wrap up for today's class, is kind of in the class, the same where, place where I began it, is helping you to understand that this understanding and these teachings of the cycle of rebirth while it's informative, while it's interesting, while some people might even use the cycle of rebirth as motivation in order to apply dedication and diligence to learning and practicing to get to enlightenment, I don't suggest that anybody ever believe the cycle of rebirth or put a whole lot of time, effort, and energy into you know investigating it until you're much further on the path. Because you're not interested in believing the cycle of rebirth. And as you see potentially the way that I taught, there's no way that I'm trying to convince people to believe in the cycle of rebirth. If you observe the, the past lives that you've had, you'll have 100% certainty that the cycle of rebirth is 100% the truth. But until that occurs, there's certain things that happen in the world that you can look at and you can kind of glean some of the information that I shared today about how you can see a lot of human beings in the unenlightened state are functioning very much like animals. And this can help you to see that portion of the cycle of rebirth in these various realms. Um, if you've had deja vu, that can help you see that portion of it. If you've seen or communicated with heavenly beings or you've seen or communicated with afflicted spirits or you've seen or communicated with hell beings, that can give you that those pieces of it. But perhaps at this point in your life, enough of those pieces haven't come together in order for you to be fully convinced that the cycle of rebirth is true or real. And that's okay. That's where you're at right now. But as you learn and practice, particularly the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and everything else, you can get to a point where there's been enough pollution that is eliminated where you may start seeing more and more of these things. There might be more and more of these connections that occur where you do start putting it together and you do start seeing it as being the truth. But in reality, somebody could actually get all the way to enlightenment, having learned all the other teachings of the Buddha, except for the cycle of rebirth, and get all the way to enlightenment and still at that point have not seen any real true evidence of the cycle of rebirth. And that's okay. As long as your mind's enlightened, that's all that matters, that you're no longer experiencing any discontentedness whatsoever. So again, what I shared at the beginning of what happened in the past is in the past. I know with 100% certainty, every single being that exists today has had countless rebirths. And I know that any being that doesn't get to enlightenment is going to experience rebirth in the future. But what I know uh, doesn't necessarily mean that's what you know. And you don't have to be in a position where you're trying to force it, um, where you're trying to force this understanding of the cycle of rebirth. Not that that's what 
you said you were doing, but just encouraging you not to do that. Because if we try to force something, then the mind's gonna want to reject it. So instead, just understand that it is 100% the truth that there is these five realms of existence and all the other things that I shared today. I know this to be 100% the truth through direct experience. And this information can be helpful so that as you look around the world, you might start putting together more and more of these pieces and you might ultimately come to the conclusion for yourself two years from now, five years from now, 15 years from now, you might have enough evidence at that point that you know that the cycle of rebirth is true with 100% certainty. But as long as you're focused on the core path, which are those core teachings that I usually mention, that's what's really important. So this can be something that you set to the side and just know that it exists and know that it's there, but then just really become determined, dedicated, and diligent to focusing on the Eightfold Path and all the connecting teachings that come into that, because that's what's going to move the mind to enlightenment. Whether there was five realms or a hundred realms or a thousand realms, um, it matters in terms of it's important to only speak the truth, and there's five realms, but it really truly doesn't matter in terms of you getting to enlightenment is it's that eightfold path that is going to be the training that you need to get to enlightenment. So I would encourage any students to focus on that and then just set this to the side. And then as you explore more, by the time you get to volume 11 of this book series, that's where the series really goes into the cycle of rebirth in these realms of existence. And by that time, you will probably be a good year and a half, two years into your training and at that point, the mind may have eliminated enough pollution that you actually are starting to observe past lives, maybe or may not. Um, but just set this whole thing to the side and just know that it's there and then really stay focused on the Eightfold Path. Thank you, Teacher David. You're welcome. No any questions? Okay, any other questions from anywhere else, Miranda? Uh, no, sir, not at this time. Okay. Well, thank you all for, for joining. And as I answered that last question, I was kind of wrapping up the class and where I was going to kind of guide you guys to is, you know, this is great information. This is absolutely the truth, but you may not have had enough of the pieces come together yet for you to understand that it's the truth. So remember that this is just an introduction to help you understand. And the way that I present the cycle of rebirth as an introduction is as a way to help you continue to evolve to enlightenment. <clears throat> the way that I present it here is as this evolution of animal consciousness to human consciousness so that where you see the animalistic behaviors and conduct, you can purge that out of your life and then move closer and closer to enlightenment. That's what's going to ultimately help you. The cycle of rebirth in these five realms and understanding that that's the bigger problem, it can be motivation and encouragement for you. I use that all the way through. I never believed that the cycle of rebirth was actually real. I didn't believe it. Um, I just set it to the side and I knew that it was something that was a, a potential. And I just used that as encouragement and motivation because if all the other teachings of the Buddha are true, and you're seeing that through the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts and others, then if the Buddha is real, if the Buddha was indeed telling the truth about the cycle of rebirth, who would really be interested in coming back and experiencing grief and misery and despair and displeasure over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? And sure, there's enough enjoyment in life and we tend to focus on those enjoyments but there's a lot of grief and despair and displeasure in existence as well so if you get to the point where you focus enough on those core teachings and you see the mind moving to enlightenment it's not like the buddha just kind of slipped in these five realms of existence just like aha i got you i told the truth about these 99.9 percent .9 of all these other teachings but i didn't tell the truth about this you know a buddha doesn't function that way a buddha is only going to share things based on their own direct experience that's how you come to the truth as a buddha and that's how you cultivate wisdom as a buddha is through your own direct experience and you may not have had enough experiences yet 
to put together the understanding of the cycle of rebirth. And that's okay if that's where you're at. But if you'd like to use it as motivation and encouragement that, hey, I'm not interested in coming back to any of this stuff ever again, then you can use it that way and just use it to propel you and look at the conditioned consciousness as you're not interested in continuing to maintain that, that you would like to purify the mind and get to this unconditioned mind where the mind is enlightened, experiencing peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. So thank you all for joining in today's class. Our next class, next Sunday, we're going to be in chapter 21, which is all about the future of our planet. Uh, discussing how craving, anger, and ignorance has affected our planet and how we can make decisions on a personal level in order to improve that for our own life. So I'll be discussing this as part of our uh, class next week. You're welcome to read that chapter before and or after class, and that will help you in our discussion. Uh, you'll see that there's very little that I'm actually going to be teaching in that class. It's more a time for a group discussion for us to talk about things that we observe in the world and about the planet. So we'll be doing that on next Sunday. And then this Wednesday, we'll be doing loving kindness meditation together. So you're welcome to attend for that. And on Saturdays, we do the Pali Canon and English study group. So you're welcome to join for that if you like at any point. So thank you again. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day. Sawadikha. Sawadikha. Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.